Amen. God's presence is awesome. Well, today we're going to continue in our series on relationships. How many people have been enjoying our series on relationships? We're going to be going a couple extra weeks than we originally planned, uh, but we're, we've been enjoying it so much that we're going to continue on that. And before we get into today's lesson, what we're going to do is we're going to do just a little bit of review of what we've uh, been going over the past few weeks. Uh, we originally talked about relationships, the foundation of relationships. Um, we talked about how to build good relationships, how to care for relationships, how to maintain our relationships. Last week, we talked about influence in our relationships and how we can evaluate the relationships we have and see whether the influence is something that's influencing us in a negative way or we're talking we we talked also about how we can be a positive influence on others this week actually last week i told you that this week we're going to talk about forgiveness but you'll have to forgive me because we're not going to talk about forgiveness we're going to push that back a couple weeks, but um, if you don't know how to forgive, then come back in two weeks and you can forgive me for not talking about forgiveness. But, <laughs> but what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about marriage. And honestly, for me, this is a, a special day for me to talk about marriage because tomorrow is my anniversary. Yay! And Ange, can you stand up? This is my beautiful wife, Angie. She was playing the piano up here. And tomorrow is our 19th wedding anniversary. Yeah. She doesn't look like we've been married 19 years, does she? No. But my gray hair kind of gives it away, so. But yeah, so I get to preach on the day before we have our 19th anniversary and we get to talk about marriage. So that's pretty, pretty cool. But yeah, we're going to talk about marriage today. And... If you are here with your husband or wife, what I would like for you to do is to just sit a little bit closer to your husband and wife. Uh, Pastor Mara and Leah, come on, be a good example to all of us, yeah? All right, the rest of us, if, we're, uh, if you have your husband or wife here, just kind of get close to them, maybe hold their hands during our, uh, our message. If you're single, just hold your own hand. And <laughs> but seriously, though, if you're single, though, I also want you to pay attention while, while uh, we're talking today. Don't just kind of tune out, oh, this isn't for me. Uh, but this is for you. Because I believe that marriage is something that's very important, not just for people who are married, but it's a, something that's foundational in the body of Christ. It's foundational, not just in church, but it's, it's foundational in society. And marriage is God's idea. Marriage is God's idea. Why don't you guys say that with me? Marriage is God's idea. Marriage is not something that man made up. Okay, it's not something that man thought, um, yeah, let's, let's invent something and let's call it marriage. No, man didn't make that up. M marriage was not something that a government made up. You don't see some countries where people get married, some, some countries where they don't get, it, it wasn't instituted by a government. Marriage is God's idea. Marriage is the first relationship that was instituted by God. It's the very, very first relationship between men, a man and a woman, that God instituted. It's not something that man made up. It's not something that man decided. It's not something that a government said, okay, now in order to have a good society, we need to have relationships, and we'll call it the family, we'll call it a marriage, we'll have a man and a woman. No, no. Man didn't do that. This is God's idea. This is God's idea. And 
I want us to think about it as something holy and sacred. Just like we're in the presence of God, just like the sacredness of the presence of God, marriage is something holy and sacred. It's not something that we just think about it flippantly. We just think about it, oh, yeah, it's just something. No, marriage is instituted by God himself. This is God's idea. A couple months ago, we were in a series about the fruitful season. And one of the messages that I brought in, or sorry, one of the messages that I spoke, I brought in a bunch of seeds. And in just thinking about the seed, I had like apple seeds, and I think I had a mango seed, and I had different seeds, <clears throat> different seeds from different fruits. And I brought them in because in thinking about it, you know, there's so much potential in a seed, and that's what we were talking about is the potential. But the way that I think about it, one of the ways that I think about it is you hold that seed in your hand, and you think about the generations of that seed and that plant and that tree and that fruit going back from generation to generation to generation to generation, there at the very, very beginning, there was one apple tree. There was one tree that God put in the garden, and then that apple tree had apples, and then the seeds from the apples fell into the ground, made another tree, made another tree, made another tree, made another tree, and they have lasted from the generations, from, the, from creation, all the way until now. Okay, now my, nowadays we might have different varieties of apples or different things like that. But they started and they had their origin with God. That's the same thing with marriage. Marriage had its origin in God. This is God's idea. He started it, and it's something that's holy and sacred. And if we don't get anything else out of this this afternoon, I hope that we can go away understanding just a little bit more that marriage is something that, God, that comes from God, and it is something that we need to give a very, very high value to because it is something that God gives a high value to as well. Amen? Another interesting thing about marriage has its origin in God, but it has its origin before the fall of man. When we look at the book of Genesis, we always talk about before Adam and Eve sinned and after Adam and Eve sinned. And we see some of the consequences after they sinned and some of the, you know, the generations of, of sin later on and what happens and all that. But marriage is something that God instituted before Adam and Eve sinned. It's not something that God gave us because we sinned and now we live in this fallen state and we have to have marriage. No, marriage came before that. And so it's something that's even more precious and more holy and it's God's idea from the very, very beginning. It's not, marriage isn't like a, a, a plan B. Marriage isn't a plan B because we failed and now we, okay, now you, we got to keep you together somehow. So we'll make this thing called marriage. And no, this was God's plan A. Marriage is God's plan A for people, for our relationships. Let's read in Genesis 2. There we go. So, okay, we're going to read Genesis 2, 21 to 24. Uh, so let me just read. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, whoa, man. I mean, then he said... This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. 
She shall be called woman. Whoa, man, that's right. Because she was taken out of man. Okay, verse 24. Therefore, okay, I want you to remember this part here. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So this is where God instituted marriage. Okay, in the garden, before the fall, you had Adam, you had Eve. They were the first married couple. And they were married in the presence of God. They were married in the garden. And God said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So this is the first marriage, Adam and Eve. And then later on you see other marriages. Uh, when we read the story of Abraham uh, and Isaac and Jacob, you see different stories of different marriages taking place in there. And you see all through... The Old Testament into the New Testament, you see lots of different marriages taking place. But this is the very, very first one that God instituted, and he instituted it in the garden. Okay, it was, Marriage was not created by man. It was not created by a government. It was not created as a result of the fall. It was, it was created before the fall. But it was created by God for man. Okay? For us, and there's, and there's different reasons, and we'll talk about it, that what God thinks about it and what God expects and, what, and some of the blessings that we see from marriage. Let's go to uh, Matthew 19. Okay, so we see this is, the first one was in Genesis. At the very beginning, God said, um, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. In Matthew 19, this is the words of Jesus, Okay. Pharisees came to him, which is Jesus, and they tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And Jesus, seeing through their uh, attempts at trickery and deception, Jesus answered, he says, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So we see in the beginning, okay, God instituted marriage. We see Jesus reaffirmed marriage, okay, in talking to the Pharisees. And then we also see in Ephesians, there's one more chapter, one more verse, we want to, 5 verses 28 to 32. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. So for all of us husbands out there, our job is to nourish and cherish our wives, just like Christ does the church. Today, in the presence of God, God himself came down. God is enthroned in it in the praises of his people. God himself came down, and we were encouraged. He nourished us. He cherished us. These are the things that he did to us. And, he's, and, and Paul here is saying, this is what, what men need to do for their wives as well. And he continues on, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. And then the same passage that we see in Genesis, and then we see that Jesus reaffirmed, we, hear, we see Paul reaffirm it again. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So we see in the Bible three times one at the beginning, one by Jesus, and also by Paul when talking to uh, the churches, is that he's saying, this is marriage. A husband and wife, a man and a woman, leaving and coming together, separating from others, and separating themselves to each other, and becoming one flesh. This is a man and a woman. This is a, a, a marriage 
But it's also talking about what Christ has done for the church. We see here in Ephesians. The same love that Jesus has for the church is the same love that we are to have in our marriage relationships. And the husband is to have for his wife and the wife to love the husband and to respect and to, to honor, just like we all see in, in Ephesians chapter 5 there. Now, I know that society in civilizations, I was reading a little bit about um, the fall of the Roman Empire. And they say, there's lots of, there's lots of reasons why they say that, that, uh, there was, that the Roman Empire fell. But they say one of the reasons is because of the breakdown of the family structure in the Roman Empire. And they say that that was one of, the, one of the reasons. There's lots of other reasons as well. But they say that one reason that the Roman Empire fell was because of the breakdown of family relationships. Nowadays, marriage is undervalued and it is under attack. Marriage is undervalued and it is under attack. Selfishness and marriage are incompatible. Selfishness and marriage are incompatible. You cannot go into a marriage selfishly. As soon as you go into a marriage selfishly, you're setting yourself up for failure. I remember someone said once, said, I didn't know how selfish I was until I got married. <laughs> And they said, and then I had kids, and I saw once again how selfish I was. <laughs> All right, she's taking credit for it, so I didn't ask her permission. That was my wife who said that. <laughs> you don't know how selfish you are until you, until you get married, and then you're like, oh my goodness, I am so selfish. You try to maintain that selfishness in a marriage, boy, oh boy, you're in for a rude awakening. Because you're quickly going to learn that life is not all about you. Another thing that our, our society and our, our culture tends to teach us is one about selfishness. You know, just kind of have your own way and you do you and you live for you. And marriage is incompatible with that. Marriage is about sacrifice. Think about how Christ loved the church. What did Christ do? Well, he died on a cross. That's our example. That's our example of love. That's our example of what a husband does for a wife. Lays down their life. Okay? So selfishness and marriage are incompatible. Also, we see the, the valuing in our, in our culture and society. We see the valuing of feelings and emotions. Okay? Above all else. Now, I'm not here to say that emotions and uh, feelings are, are not important. They are very important. They're created by God. They're part of our soul. Okay? But they're not to lead us. Okay? The emotions and the feelings are not to lead us. In love and in a marriage relationship, there are four types of love. Four types of love that are talked about. The first one is the, uh, is the fondness kind of love, where I, 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 I love something because I'm familiar with it. I, 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 I know that. They, they've been with me for a long time, and I know them, and I'm familiar with it, and I love that thing. For example, okay? I have, um, I have an aunt, and she is not 100% mentally all there, but she's part of my family, and I've known her since I was born. And when we go and see her, she's, you know, she's not always the nicest person to, she's got some attitudes and different things like that, and she's not always the nicest person to talk to. Sometimes she can be a little bit mean, but... We love her. She's part of our family. And so 
because of the fondness that we have for her, we love her. Okay, can be the same thing for, um, I don't know, for another example for me personally is uh, the home, the, the town that I grew up in. It's nothing to speak about. It's nothing to, you know, it's nothing really that important or that big, but it's the town that I know. It's the town that I grew up in. And I have a fondness for it. And so that's one type of love. Another type of love is the friendship type of love. When the, 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 the love that you have with a good friend, you've spent a lot of time with them, you have shared experiences together with them. So there's friendship love. Another love is the romantic type of love. Okay? In English, we only have one word, love. Yeah, I love my fried chicken, and I love my car, and I love my moto, and I love my wife. Are they all the same? No, 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 no. They're not all the same. Okay? But we only have one word for it. But there's different, <clears throat> there's different types of words that we can use. So there's the affection love. There's the friendship love. There's the romantic love. And then there's the commitment love, which is the agape love, which you've probably heard about, and which is God's commitment, unconditional commitment love to us. One of the things that we see is the elevation of the romantic part and not so much concern with all of the other stuff. And if, if that romance is the only definition of love that we have, like we see a lot in our culture, when that feeling is gone, oh, well, I guess I don't need this marriage anymore because it's not meeting my needs. It's not making my heart beat fast again. It's not uh, making me feel happy and warm inside. And so you, when you elevate one love above all the others, then you start to go down the wrong road. It's not saying that that love is bad, but the, 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 the marriage relationship is meant to have all four. It's meant to have that, that fondness. It's meant to have that friendship. It's meant to have the romance. And it's also meant to have the commitment love, which is God's example to us. And so... One of the things that we see that can be a danger for marriage is when we elevate feelings and romance above everything else because if you think that's the only kind of love there is, once that's gone, you feel like, oh, man, i got to find another place to find that romance. And that, that's what our culture has done. So marriage is undervalued and under attack. Another attack that we see against marriage is the, against the traditional definition of marriage. Um, nowadays, we see a lot of different definitions of marriage. Like this person can get married to this person, and you know, that person can get married to that person. And uh, it's not the way that God intended it. God intended marriage to be one man and one woman for life. Very simple, but very difficult to do. But that's God's marriage. And when those things are under attack and when the definition, the, the groundwork, the definition of marriage gets broken down, then marriages start to crumble. When marriages crumble, families crumble. When families crumble, societies crumble. And we see the results of that. We see an increase in in. In, in broken families and hurting children and, and people not being able to trust, not being able to have close relationships because of these broken, broken families and broken relationships. So what are some things that we can do? We want to maintain that sacredness, that holiness, the way that God intended for us to have our marriages. It's not saying that we have to be perfect. I don't want to give you this idea that, okay, yeah, everyone's got to be perfect. We got to walk and make everybody think that we got the perfect marriage and everything's awesome. No, let's be real. Okay, I, let's take that pressure off of you. You don't got to be perfect. Okay, everybody can take a deep breath. I don't got to be perfect. Okay, and let's live life 
the way that God wants us to, use the tools that God has given us so that we can continue in, relation, in good relationships and make our marriage better. But the first thing that I think we, need, we do need to do in, in making our marriage relationships better is to value marriage. Let's all agree that this is a God thing. Let's all agree that, okay, yeah, you have this, the paper that you sign from the government or, you know, the marriage license, the marriage certificate or whatever. But when we got married, we got married before God. We got married before God. We got married. God is a part of this relationship. Pastor Samadhi read this verse, and I'm going to read it today. <clears throat> he read this verse in first, first service and second service, but it's from Ecclesiastes chapter 4. It says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. How many? How many are better than one? Two. All right. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, how many? Two, right? Okay, I'll read it again. Again, if two lie together, so two, again, right? Two, 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 right? Again, if two lie together, they keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. How many? Two, 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 right? And then... Verse 12, it finishes. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. I thought we were talking about two people. Two, two, two. A threefold cord. What? Three? But who's that third? God is in the middle of our relationships. God has to be in the middle of our relationships, right? That third is God. We couldn't do this without God. We couldn't do this for 19 years without God. Two, 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 but there's a third. A threefold cord is not easily broken. God has to be at the center. God has to be at the center of your relationships. The closer you get to God, the closer you'll get to each other. That's just the way that it works. So value your marriage as God values it. Stay close to God. Understand that God is in the middle. Understand that the one that you're married to is the one who God has planned for your life. Now, some people might think, oh yeah, well, I got married when I was unsaved. Maybe I made a bad decision then. Well, you know what? The one that you're married to now is the one that God has for your life. Okay? Don't even let those doubts get in. God can redeem. God can make something amazing out of what was a mess before. My friend who got married the day, two days before his, his daughter was born, God has made something beautiful out of a mess. God has made something beautiful out of a mess. And so maybe you made some crazy decisions before you became a Christian. Okay, but God is with you now. God doesn't want you to separate and divorce. That's not God's plan. He's got different words in the Bible about that. But He is faithful. He is faithful. And He wants you to be sure that he is in your relationship. He is in your marriage. He is with you. He is not going to leave you. And he's going to help you make it through. When we honor God and when we honor what God honors, he helps us through. In our marriage relationships, we need to apply the principles that we have been talking about in this relationship series. We've talked about staying committed to our relationships. Even when seasons change. Remember we talked about seasons changing in people's lives. 
to stay committed to that relationship. Maybe, you know, you start to have kids and you don't get to spend as much time with your friends. Don't cut them off. Stay committed to the relationships. The same is true with marriages. We need to make sure that we're staying committed. A big, big thing that helps marriages is learning about repentance and forgiveness. Repentance is the doorway that God has created for us to enter back into intimate relationships. When there's an offense, forgiveness is the way back into relationships, to healed relationships, to restored relationships. It's forgiveness. That's the way what God does with us so that we can enter back into relationship with him, but it also works in our relationships with others too. So it has to be, has to be. Restored relationships have to be through forgiveness. And I encourage you, if you want to learn more about that, we're going to, in two weeks, we're going to talk specifically just about forgiveness. And I'm actually really excited about it because we've been preparing and I think it's going to be a real, real good time. Um, another, another key for marriages, always give more than you get. Give more than you get. Don't go into a marriage or don't think about your marriage as what can I get? What can they do for me? You're setting yourself up for failure if you're going to think that way. The key is to think, what can I give? How can I serve? How can I bless their life? How can I make their life better? When thinking about your, your spouse. There's a quote by a guy. <clears throat> His name is Victor Frankel. And Victor Frankel, he was a he was in a concentration camp. He was a Jew, and he was in a concentration camp during World War II. He was in a German concentration camp. He was a doctor, and he was a, a psychiatrist. When he was in the concentration camp, he was mostly surviving, but there was some time when he was actually called upon to do some doctoring to some of the uh, some of the patients or some of the people who were in the concentration camp there with him. After he got out of the concentration camp, he wrote a book about his experience. And the book is Man's Search for Purpose. And the first half of the book is basically just talking him talking about um, what he experienced in the camp and just some of the horrific things that he saw and some of the other people that were in there with him. The second half is kind of his evaluation as a psychiatrist. And he said the people who had a purpose, the people who were looking out and thinking about their purpose, could be your family, could be uh, your job on the outside, someone who had a focus and a vision, those were the people who survived in the concentration camp. The people who were just thinking about themselves and woe is me and what can I, my comfort and this, those are the people who ended up dying in the concentration camp. But the people who survived were the people who were outward looking and the people who had a purpose. And he says, he said, one of, his, one of the quotes in the book, it says, it didn't really matter what we expected from life, but rather what life expected from us. And I think that's the way that we need to look too. Let's not think about what I expect, what I'm going to get. No, God has given each one of us, and not just in marriages, but in every relationship that we have. What can we give? What is expected of us? God has placed talents and skills and anointings on each one of us. He's given us things, not so that we can get credit for anything, not so that we can have a comfy life, but he's given us a purpose in that too. What can you give? And especially in a marriage, what can you give? How can you serve? How can you serve your spouse? 
Or maybe you say, okay, how can I join together with my spouse and start to have a purpose together with my spouse to live and to give and to serve and to impact our generation for God. Because this generation needs strong marriages. This generation needs strong families. This church needs you to have a strong marriage. Because if we want to see this church continue for generation and generation after generation after generation, it's about families. It's about marriages. God instituted it thousands and thousands of years ago in the garden before sin. But it carries through to today. It has that same impact. It has that same sacredness and value. And it has that same supernatural, life-changing, generation-impacting ability. It's marriage. It's God's plan. Amen? Let's all stand up together. God is so good to us. He shows us his ways. He shows us his word. But he, he doesn't abandon us. He doesn't leave us. And I know that probably today in this room, there are people who are having problems in their marriage relationship. Maybe it's not what you expected it. Maybe you got married and you thought things were going to be one way and you think about the happily ever after. But then the reality hits and, boy, it's not quite what I expected. I wasn't expecting this. I wasn't anticipating that things were going to be so difficult. I want to tell you today that our God is a God of miracles. Our God is a God who changes hearts. Our God is a God who can bring something beautiful out of the brokenness. And I want you to have faith today. I prayed with someone just this morning. I said, please pray for my family. Please pray for my marriage. Please pray for this relationship with it's, it's, it's so difficult. God can do it. Amen? If God created it and God wants it to happen, He's not going to leave you alone if you ask Him for help. He's going to say, wow. He's going to see from heaven. He's going to see you and says, okay, here's somebody who wants what I want. Here's someone who loves what I love. Here, take my heavenly virtue. Take my miracle for your situation. God will do it. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, today, in your presence, I release your anointing. I release your miracles for relationships. God, for marriages, for broken hearts, oh God. Lord, I release faith for people who, maybe they're, they're anticipating marriage. I pray a virtue for them, oh God. I pray an excitement for, for an anticipation to live life the way that you intended, oh God. Lord, I pray for each one of us that we would go away today valuing your mar valuing marriage just a little bit more, God. Lord, I pray for those people who are just newly married. Lord, who are still trying to figure things out. Lord God, and I pray for a grace upon them, oh God. Lord, I pray for a grace upon all the newlyweds, oh God. I pray for a grace for those people who are just having kids. I know that kids is a big transition as well, God. I pray for a grace for that. Lord, I pray for a grace for those people who 
their relationships have been broken. But God, I pray for your healing. God, you're a God of miracles. God, you're a God of wonders. You're a God who does it, God. And we call upon your name, God. We call upon you to do it. Open up the heavens over relationships. Open up the heavens over marriages. Open up the heavens over homes and families, oh God. And I pray, God, that New Life Fellowship would be known as a, a church of strong families, a church of strong marriages, to see the future change, to see this country change for your glory. God, because it is in you we put our hope. It is in you that our marriages have life and truth and peace, oh God. Lord, we thank you so much for your faithfulness. We thank you for your perfect love that never leaves us or forsakes us, that gives us strength in our weakness. We thank you and we praise you this day. In Jesus' name we pray. We also want to open up the altars now. We're done, but we also want to open up the altars. Anybody who wants prayer, maybe in your marriage or family or relationships, you've been struggling or you don't, you know, been having this issue or maybe someone in your family, we want to pray together with you. We want to join our hands and join our hearts together with you to see God do a miracle for you. Thank you guys so much for coming this afternoon. God bless you. If you have any prayer needs, come on up. We'd love to pray with you. Amen. God bless you.